Thank you, Scott. You've taken my first words away from me, but that's fine. Uh, so I can just go on to the next slide, which I won't spend too much time on. This uh, shows our collaborators. And uh, the people listed here are people who are actually developing code or running code on Blue Waters. And uh, there are many more people involved in doing analysis of the output of Blue Waters. So uh, first, I'd like to tell you about some of the key challenges that we have to deal with in our field. Um, Lattice QCD has to support some large experimental programs in high energy and nuclear physics because we're not inexpensive. If we were cheap theorists, we could do whatever the heck we want. But when we're asking for money for computers, which we do through US QCD, and when we ask for great amounts of computer time, we have to be able to be relevant. And uh, QCD itself is a strongly coupled nonlinear quantum field theory. Um, the lat lattice QCD was invented by Ken Wilson, a Nobel laureate, although he did not win the Nobel Prize for inventing QCD, lattice QCD. He did. And it requires large scale uh, computer power to do first principle calculations. And we have to do a variety of calculations in order to control the systematic errors that come from this numerical technique. In our PRAC, we're actually supporting two different sub-projects. One of them uses what's called the highly improved staggered quark formalism, also known as HISC, which is better than what we used to do, which had another acronym, ASTAD. And in the, on the HISC side of the calculations, we study fundamental parameters of the standard model. And these are things such as the quark masses of the up, down, strange, bottom, and charm quarks. And also, there's something called the CKM matrix, which I'll mention uh, again later. Uh, so we have to calculate those mixing matrix elements by comparing our theoretical calculations with experiment. On the other side of the PRAC, we're using what's called the Wilson-Clover action, and that goes directly back to Ken Wilson with some improvements. And uh, there we're studying uh, the masses and decays of certain states, which are called mesons. They're made out of a quark and an antiquark. And there are ex ex uh, what are called exotic states. And the exotic states are, are states that could not be made out of just a quark and an antiquark. And that means they include additional excitations from what are called the gluons. And the gluons are the force carriers that make the quarks stick together. Um, so this is a picture of some of the states that have been studied in the theory. Um, so there are a bunch of different states with different quantum numbers. And way over here are the exotics. Um, the exotics uh, include these extra gluonic excitations. And there's an experiment at JLab that I'll mention again later. And that experiment uh, is designed, excuse me, to look for exotics. Um, so here's some evidence that they exist from our numerical calculations. But to help the experimentalists, we also want to compute the different decays of these particles because it's not going to be uh, that clean to find them. There's a lot going on in the experiment. Uh, right now on Blue Waters, we're working on 40 cubed by 256 space-time grids and a pion mass of 230 MeV. That's about twice as heavy as in nature. And uh, what we plan to do in the next year is uh, move to make configurations that we'll be able to study on 64 cubed by a 128 grid, but with a physical pion mass. So that should be more uh, amenable to um, comparing with experiment. Um, so this is, these results are a little bit older. Um, they're on a smaller grid with even heavier pions. Okay. So Blue Waters is letting us uh, do a better job. Um, so why are we doing these things? Well, uh, the standard model of elementary particle physics uh, contains three of the forces we know of in nature. The strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force are all part of the standard model. The weak force and electromagnetic force are both quite weak and they can be dealt with quite adequately with what's called uh, perturbation theory uh, developed by Feynman, Schwinger, and Tamanaga for which they got the Nobel Prize. And these techniques date back to the 1940s. Uh, gravity, uh, however, is not part of the standard model. Uh, the standard model explains an awful lot of experimental data. There are just a few chinks in it, and the fact that neutrinos have mass, which was not part of the original standard model, but is not that radical a departure. 
Uh, one of the things that disturbs us about the standard model in terms of having a funda fundamental understanding is that there are many undetermined parameters within the standard model, which would be the strength of the electromagnetic force, the strength of the strong force, the strength of the weak force, and the masses of all the quarks, and these CKM mixing matrix elements. Um, so if there's a more fundamental theory, we would like to be able to explain those things. There are other more theoretical reasons why we don't think the standard model is complete, but there's no time to go into that here. Um, so it turns out that many of the aspects of the strong force that we'd like to calculate, that we'd like to be able to uh, compare with experiment, required us to do these strongly coupled uh, quantum field theory calculations for which the lattice is the current best technique. If you're really clever, uh, maybe you can come up with a, another technique and I can retire in peace. Okay, and uh, save a lot of computer time. Uh, so up right now, we do need lattice QC do, to do these types of calculations. Um, so on the nuclear physics side, we like to predict these bound states that I mentioned, particularly glue balls, which are states that don't actually include uh, quarks and antiquarks and all, but are just gluonic ex excitations and then the exotic states that include both gluonic excitation of uh, a quark-antiquark bound state. Uh, again, going back to the CKM matrix element, it describes how quarks would mix under weak decays. So a, a, quark, a heavy quark decaying decays into a combination of the lighter quarks. And uh, the particular combination is determined by this matrix. Now, Kobayashi and Maskawa are the K and M. They received the Nobel Prize in 2008 for uh, realizing that in a, a model that has a three by three mixing matrix uh, can explain uh, some interesting properties of uh, um, elementary particle physics and at, at, perhaps crucial to the beginning of the universe, um, which is charge conjugation uh, violation and parity violation. Um, so they got the Nobel Prize for defining the matrix. It's left for people like us to actually figure out what the numbers are inside the matrix. And that requires these calculations and it requires experiments. Uh, one very interesting thing about this is different uh, physical decays might, get, might be interpreted as, a, as coming from different uh, values of these matrix elements. So if when we interpret these decays as coming just from standard model physics, if you get different values for the matrix elements, that means there's new physical interactions and that would be prize worthy. I think you know the prize I mean. Okay, however, doing that requires high precision um, because we have to very accurately get these matrix elements and hopefully I will show you uh, later some examples of that. And the experiments to uh, measure these decays cost hundreds of mega dollars. And with, if we don't uh, provide the QCD effects, um, you can't get the actual interpretation of that in terms of the theory and the CKM matrix elements. Okay. And again, high precision is important because any new interactions are weak. If they weren't, we probably would have seen them already. Okay. Um, another place where precision is important is we now discovered the Higgs boson just a, less than three years ago at the Large Hadron Collider. And, but now people will, will want to study the Higgs boson in great detail to see if there's evidence for new physics there. And for instance, you need to have very high accurate prediction for the B quark mass and for the strong coupling constant to calculate how B quarks would decay, or, uh, sorry, how the Higgs meson would decay in great de detail, Higgs boson. Uh, another example where there may be a chink in the standard model is there's about a three sigma difference between theory and experiment for the muon G minus two experiment and a new experiment, well actually the apparatus for the experiment that was done at Brookhaven National Lab has been moved to Fermilab and they expect to increase the precision there by a factor of four and the biggest error in the theory comes from QCD. Uh, going back to the nuclear side, $300 million has been sent to upgrade uh, Jefferson Lab to look for these bound states, uh, the exotic bound states that I mentioned. And uh, the glue X experiment at Hall D and the class two experiment at Hall B are two of the experiments that are doing that. 
And Craig Steffen is one of the people who worked on the pre precursor of the GLUEX experiment, which I just verified. He was a grad student at IU. I'll mention Craig again later. Um, now, it would be best if we can get predictions for these decays uh, to guide the experiment. Predictions are always more convincing for theorists than postdictions. There are a number of other uh, milestones for lattice QCD that have been defined by the Nuclear Science Advisory Committee. And so we'd like to be able to fulfill those as well. And Blue Waters will help us do that. Um, there are several other experiments that I've listed here that are relevant to this program. Um, so Blue Waters helps us a great deal. Thanks. Um, so in, using Blue Waters, we proceed in two stages. We generate gauge configurations that's done in just a few streams. Um, then we can compute observables on these configurations and often we have a thousand snapshots of the fields on which we want, later want to run physics measurements as we call them and those can be run in parallel. So we have a combination of um, capability needs and capacity needs um, and on Blue Waters some of our jobs run particularly well on the GPUs. This is one example. And we're also running some of the decay constant calculations on the GPUs. We also run just on the CPU side. Okay. I think I have to accelerate. Um, I think I'm going to skip this because I think, Scott, you said I had five more minutes? Yeah. Oh, ten. Oh, yeah. I'm doing much better than I thought. Okay. Um, so let's point to some of the results we've done. Uh, we've produced the most realistic gauge configurations to date using Blue Waters. And here's an example, 144 cubed by 288 grid, which may not sound big to some people, but when I started I was working on a 6 squared by 12 by 18 grid, just to give you an example. Um, and we have physical light quarks in this calculation. And when I was doing those little calculations, there really actually were no light quarks at all. So we've really come a long way, which I can barely hint at here. So with these HISC configurations that we've done, we've had two physical review letters published already, and we've had one longer paper in physical review D, and one is in process, uh, has been submitted, not yet accepted. Uh, one of these two PRLs was uh, designated an editor's suggestion, which means it was highlighted, which is uh, quite nice for us and for Blue Waters. Um, the clover quark propagators that we've done on Blue Waters on the nuclear physics side have been uh, used in spectrum calculations and I showed you uh, an example of that in uh, one of the very early slides. So in the past year we've completed 485 of these configurations of the 32 cubed by 256 size and now we're starting a larger size and it's important to have a range of different sizes in order to understand the decays. And so far this has resulted in another PRL and a paper in Physical Review D. Okay. Uh, I want to mention the thanks we owe to Bob Fiedler and to Craig Steffen. They've helped us with our topology aware scheduling and I'll ha show a graph of that on the next slide which may be of interest to other people who were thinking uh, this might help their code. Uh, one of the things we've done, um, uh, particularly Frank Winters, is use just-in-time compilation techniques and that has really helped improve the efficiency of our GPU code. Uh, that work appeared in IP uh, DPS 14. I'll show a, a little reference later. And then there's other parts of the code that we continue to work on. So here's the slide about topology aware running. Um, up here in blue we see some runs on 2048 nodes. This is the number of node hours it takes to complete a particular task, so lower down is better. And this shows uh, three different runs and the variation, and the, the speed of these runs was 15 to 16 teraflops. Um, then in dark red, we have single uh, runs on two different node sizes, which ran at 51.5 and about 40 teraflops. Um, and then a series of runs on 2034 nodes, and note how the variation here is larger. This is smoother, which is good. And um, this is the highest efficiency we've gotten so far in terms of the total number of node hours. And that's running at about 30 teraflops. So we've had almost a factor of two uh, performance improvement on this particular type of code 
uh, or run. There are other runs which are not quite as dramatic, so I didn't show those. Um, this shows the just-in-time uh, improvements in the uh, code running on the GPUs. So um, again, this is in time for a particular task. So high is bad and low is good. So this is just running on CPUs. And then this blue part is adding our inverter for the code that runs on the GPUs on the library we call CUDA, Q-U-D-A. All our community codes start with Q pretty much, our libraries from the SIDAC program. And then when you add the just-in-time uh, compilation, it lets more of the code um, that wasn't part of the CUDA suite, suite run on the GPU, and it's about a four-time improvement. And so if you can get a hold of IPDPS, the authors are Winter, Clark, Edwards, and Ju. Okay, this is another example of uh, some code development. In this case, we introduced uh, a multi-grid solver. This was done by James Osborne, and it was integrated into Chroma by uh, Cohn and Ju. Um, and um, well, the, um, there's a 10 times improvement over the CPU solver for multiple right-hand sides by introducing the multigrid solver. And what I'm actually showing in this bar chart is, again, it's runtime, so shorter is better. This is running a non-multigrid solver on the GPUs on 32 nodes. This is running the multigrid solver on the CPUs on 16 nodes, so it's a quite a nice improvement in speed up and use of resources. And it turns out that the multigrid solver is more stable than the by CG stab, stab solver that we were using before. Thank you, Scott. Okay, I'm actually probably in pretty good shape. Um, this is a physics result. It shows um, what's called a decay constant, which is important uh, quantity that can be measured in experiment and helps us determine two of the different CKM matrix elements. And it actually shows um, a historical view. Um, so these calculations in green are ho having only up and down dynamical quarks. These are more realistic in that they include the effects of a strange quark. And these here include the effects of up, down, strange, and charm quarks. And so this is the earliest calculation on here. Uh, this is from the Fermilab Milk Collaboration, which is part of our PRAC. And so this is 10 years ago, and this shows you the precision we could achieve on these two elements. And here's what we're doing now that we have access to blue waters, which includes uh, both improved theoretical techniques and the much uh, larger calculations. And so you can see that we've uh, made really great strides using blue waters. Okay. And it's crucial to get uh, this kind of precision to really see if there are problems with the CKM matrix. Um, in this case, I'm showing you the ratio of the two decay constants I showed before. And again, you can see how dramatically better this calculation is than everything that preceded it, both because it's more realistic, because it has the charm quark, in it and uh, because uh, the precision is so much higher. Okay. And um, so this is a test of the CKM matrix element. Um, this is from a similar, this band is from a similar uh, set of measurements of decay constants, um, which was done on blue waters partially. And um, it doesn't involve heavy quarks, only light quarks. Um, this band has nothing to do with lattice QCD. This comes from nuclear beta decay. Uh, but the fact, uh, oh, and this black line is what's called unitarity. So the CKM matrix is supposed to be a unitary matrix, and we're testing unitarity in the first row. And you can see that there's a nice intersection between unitarity and these two determinations. Well, it turns out that this is another decay that we measured, a semi-leptonic decay. And a part of this running was done uh, of a, a grant on Blue Waters to Professor Aida El Khadra at the University of Illinois. There are, is time for faculty at Illinois. And it turns out that this decay, uh, the determination of the CKM matrix element, doesn't agree so well with this. 
Now that could be evidence for new physics or it could be evidence that we need to keep improving the precision of this. So it's uh, kind of interesting. And now I'm at my conclusions and I'm not sure where I am on time. Uh, so I could either just leave them up and you could ask questions or I could mumble on through them. I've always found people can read faster than I can mumble. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so happy enough. So the topology was, uh, was the improvement coming from just having a topology or allocation or did you also lay out the entire process in different ways? The, the layout is determined by a tool that Bob Fiedler provided to Doug Toussaint. And I'm not, I don't remember the name of the tool. I, I can look it up. I have the script, but um, yeah. I think it's oh, and Craig, you, Tupperware, isn't it? pardon? I think it's just called Tupperware. Tupperware. It's, it's sort of internal to Blue Waters at the moment, but um, I, I imagine we're going to push out some version of it. But basically, it's a, um, it, 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 it's basically a harness that looks at the code running and does all kinds of fancy stuff with the, the actual, um, uh, communications as the thing is running and at the end of it. So instead of some some like uh, rank ordering things which are sort of, well, you know, sequential is good or, or sequential the other way is good, it actually sort of does a weighted sum and figures out a really good way to lay it out and then when you launch it the next time, it'll do it just that way. And so it's actually a tuned rank ordering and other communication stuff. Okay, well, let me just look at the last bullet. We have miles to go before we sleep. So, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>